Welcome to the Medal of Honor Hall of Heroes induction ceremony in honor of Sergeant William Shemin and Private Henry Johnson. Sergeant Shemin and Private Johnson were both awarded our nation's highest and most prestigious award for valor by the President of the United States, the Medal of Honor. This morning, they will be formally inducted into the Pentagon's most sacred place, the Hall of Heroes. Our hosts for today's ceremony are the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Robert Work, the Under Secretary of the Army, the Honorable Brad R. Carson, the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, General Daniel B. Allen, and the Sergeant Major of the Army, Daniel A. Daly. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for the singing of our national anthem by Sergeant First Class Andre McRae and the invocation delivered by Chaplain Brian Walker. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight? O'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? Let us pray. Sovereign God, intimately aware of your presence. We ask for your blessing upon this gathering as we prepare to honor two soldiers for whom honor is due, Sergeant William Shemin and Private Henry Johnson. Although outwardly different, inwardly they shared a common devotion that compelled each to go above and beyond the call of duty and service of our nation. As a community, we express our gratitude for their faithfulness, selfless service, and demonstrated willingness to sacrifice all, if necessary, for fellow soldiers. Although now absent in body, we will cherish our legacy by collectively resolving to live our lives in such a way that honors their courage and commitment. As we add Sergeant Shemin and Private Johnson's names to the list of our nation's finest heroes, grant to each of us the strength to hold high the torch and not break faith with those who once stood their watch in freedom's fight. We ask in your name, amen. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Well, good morning, everyone. What a great crowd today. Thank you all for being here. On behalf of Secretary Carter, who is halfway around the world, literally, in India, uh, I'd like to thank all of you for being here today and to extend Secretary Carter's Personal thanks for all of you coming out. I'd also like to thank a couple people before starting. Congressman Chris uh, Gibson from the 19th District of New York. Thank you for coming, sir. And Congressman Blaine Lukemeyer from the 3rd District of Missouri. Both of them are here today, and I'll say a little bit more about them uh, later on. But thank you both for coming here today. I'd also like to thank uh, Senator Chuck Schumer. He was at the uh, ceremony yesterday. Uh, he had an important part to play in recognizing Private Johnson. He couldn't be here today, but members of his staff are. I'd like to especially welcome the many, many descendants of Sergeant William Shemin, who have gathered here to help us honor the bravery and heroic actions of their ancestor. I'm told there are as many as 66 of the family members here today. If you just raise your hand rather than welcome all. And there's a particular member of the family, uh, Sergeant Shimon's eldest daughter, 
Elsie, Elsie Shimon Roth, who is here today in the front row, and she engaged, she personally was the one who engaged the most in trying to have her father recognized for this great honor. So Elsie, thank you for everything you've done. Now today's other Medal of Honor recipient, Private Henry Johnson, unfortunately has no next of kin who could join us here today. But we are especially honored to have the State Command Sergeant Major of the New York National Guard, Lewis Wilson, who will be here today and is going to uh, accept the medal on behalf of Private Johnson. Sergeant Major, thank you very much for coming. Now this ceremony today is it's a reminder that it's never too late to correct the record, to redress the prejudices of the past, and to appropriately honor our nation's heroes. It is a feature of our republic and the American people themselves that we have the ability to correct our course and that the nation's long arc of history does not bend towards injustice, it bends towards justice. And particularly as a military institute, institution that represents literally every single member of this nation, every citizen, regardless of race, regardless of belief, regardless of preference, it is imperative that we do all we can to fix the wrongs from the past. In the case of Sergeant Shimon, it was anti-Semitism. In the case of Private Johnson, it was racism. It is important that we acknowledge the injustices and mistakes of the past and rightfully honor those who's given so much on behalf of their country. Now, Senator Schumer, as I said, who couldn't be here today, said yesterday, the great thing about America is that we undo our injustices more than any other country. But just before we came down here in my office, as I was talking uh, to Elsie and her beautiful sister, Ina, uh, what she said was especially poignant, and it was, discrimination hurts. A wrong has been made right and all is forgiven. I thought that was especially appropriate, and I wanted to share it all with you today. Now, because of the spirits of both these great Americans who fought on distance battlefields more than a century ago in World War I, they live on in each and every one of us who serves our nation, as does the spirit of all our nation's veterans. They bring a noble purpose to our lives and one that we should never forget. Both Sergeant Shimon and Private Johnson were part of the mighty force of Doughboys that we sent to France in 1917 to help war-weary allies who had been in war at that time for three long years. And they were initially fed into the line in small numbers to stem the tide of the German offenses in the spring and summer of 1918. The French and British were worn out, largely dispirited, after four hellish years in 1918 of trench warfare. It's kind of hard to imagine the lives that the individual men and on the front lines were having to go through. The Germans knew that the weakened state of the Allies' army were so, and they decided to throw one last great offensive to try to win the war. And they wanted to do that before the American numbers turned the tide. Now, the ferocity of the American troops that they initially met in combat had an immediately an immediate impact on both sides. They simultaneously lifted the spirits of the British and the French and depressed those of the Germans. The Germans characterized their new American enemies as brave, as stubborn. Boy, that's about as spot on a description of the American fighting man and woman that you can find. As one American Army Corps reported, these American personnel must be called excellent. Their spirit is high. It went on to say, our fire did not check the advance of their infantry. The nerves of these Americans are still unshaken. High praise indeed from an enemy that had endured long years of warfare. This fighting spirit of the Americans was demonstrated across the Western Front in places like Chateau Thierry, Belleau Wood, and the Argonne Forest, names that would enter the long line of American battle honors, and especially those of the United States Army and the United States Marine Corps. And it was that same fighting spirit that was displayed so strikingly by both Sergeant Shimon and Private Johnson. Now, Sergeant William Shimon was, the first, was a first-generation American. He was born of a Russian immigrant parents in Bayonne, New Jersey. He lied about his age. 
to get into the fight, and he joined the Army shortly after the United States declared war on Germany. He was with the American Expeditionary Force in France in 1918 when this big German offensive crashed across the front, and he was engaged in bloody fighting with the attacking Germans. On one day, as you will hear in the citation, on three separate occasions, Sergeant Schimann left the safety of his trench and raced across 150 yards of bullet-swept ground. He was a football player. So, as the President said yesterday, about a football field and a half. He did it not once, not twice, but three times to rescue wounded fellow soldiers. One of his officers wrote, Schimann distinguished himself by exhibiting the most efficient qualities of leadership, cool, calm, intelligence, and personally, he was utterly fearless. Though wounded during the fighting, Sergeant Schimann recovered and went on to get a degree from Syracuse University, where he played football, and he lived in the Bronx, New York, where he started a business and raised three children. As I told you, Elsie is here today. When she was 12 years old, a friend of Sergeant Schimann told her that the only reason why her father did not receive the Medal of Honor was because he was Jewish. And she made a vow that day to try to make things right. And about 13 years ago, she really started to make a lot of progress. And today and yesterday are the results of her labors. Private Henry Johnson was born in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. He later moved to New York. He joined the Army in 1917, once again as a teenager. And he was assigned to an all-black National Guard unit that would later become known as the 369th Infantry Regiment, also known as the Harlem Hellfighters. In a bitterly fought battle in May 1918, <clears throat> excuse me, Johnson and one of his fellow soldiers were cut off and surrounded by a large German raiding party. And what followed is something out of a movie. Wounded by a shower of grenades thrown by the attacking Germans, Johnson's comrade was being dragged off by the Germans into captivity. Disregarding his own injuries, Private Johnson, all five foot four of him, leapt up, smashed one of the Germans on the head with his rifle butt, drew a bolo knife, plunged it into the skull of a German, and into the stomach of another. A hellfighter indeed. And then he threw grenades at the rest of the enemy until they withdrew. Johnson was wounded but stayed with his regiment until it returned home at war's end. And by the time he left, he had 21 wounds or injuries suffered in combat. Sadly, he never recovered. And he died about 10 years later at a veterans hospital in Illinois. Once again, his bravery was overlooked. He wasn't even awarded a Purple Heart at the time because his unit was serving under French command rather than U.S. Army command. Ten years ago, he was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for his efforts, but it did not stop there. Several, um, especially uh, someone who's passed away, his name was Mr. Howe. He was a Medal of Honor winner in Vietnam. He tried to convince everyone that the award although high and although deserving, really wasn't good enough. It needed to be a Medal of Honor. And since that time, people like Representative Gibson and, Representative, and uh, Senator Schumer have worked to get this done and corrected. World War II Medal of Honor recipient Audie, Murf Audie Murphy was once asked why he single-handedly attacked an entire German company. And his response was simple. They were killing my friends. It is that same devotion to one's fellow's troops that we see in both of the accounts of Sergeant Schimann and Private Johnson. And it is the most defining characteristic of American warfighters, be they in the Army or the Marine Corps, the Navy, the Air Force, or the Coast Guard. They fight to bring each other home. The example of heroism and bravery of these two soldiers is a legacy of countless veterans who have stepped forward to serve who have went after our nation's enemy with a ferocity burning in their hearts. And over the past 14 years of war, the descendants of Sergeant Schimann and Private Johnson and all those who fought at Shiloh, at Argonne, in Normandy, at the Chosen Reservoir, in Quezon, and Samawa 
have shown our enemies again and again this same fierce American fighting spirit. The stories of Sergeant Shimon and Private Johnson illustrate something else, and that is that our all-volunteer force is stronger because of its diversity and because it represents all Americans, all cultures, all colors, all religions. And that's what makes the United States military the finest the world has ever known, because it is our people. They are our secret weapon. They are the heart and soul of a force that is best when it reflects the diversity of the nation. So I'm very, very proud to be here today representing Secretary Carter to help induct these two great Americans into the Hall of Heroes and to thank all of our nation's heroes for their service and their sacrifice, particularly those who gave their last full measure so that we all might have a better life. Now normally whenever I host an, uh, an event like this, I ask everyone in uniform or who has served in uniform as you all know, if you have the Medal of Honor, regardless of rank and regardless of position, any holder of the Medal of Honor is saluted by anyone else in our organization. Sergeant Shimon and Private Johnson never had that honor bestowed upon them. So I'd like everyone to stand and face them and let's render one last salute to these great Americans. Hand salute. ready to. Thank you so much. I appreciate you all coming. And to the Shimon family, please sit down. And to those representing uh, Private Johnson, God bless you and God bless America. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Undersecretary of the Army. Deputy Secretary of Work, General Allen, the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, his lovely wife Debbie, Sergeant Major of the Army Daily, Ms. Elsie Shemin, Ina Shemin, Command Sergeant Major Lewis Wilson, Assistant Secretaries of the Army, military service members who are gathered here today, D DOD civilians, families, friends, good morning. We gather here today to induct Sergeant William Shemin and Private Henry Johnson into the Hall of Heroes. It is now, as Secretary Work has already mentioned, almost 100 years, a full century, since those acts of valor we recognize today. But if time has passed, it has not dimmed, not yet, not by a long shot, the bright glow of these men's bravery. An age has not yet plumbed the full depths of our nation's gratitude towards them. And if today's ceremony is a little belated, it takes nothing away from the inspiration we draw from our two recipients, whose names will now join that sacred role, a fraternity forged in fire alongside the other names we also honor today, if only in silence. There are graves that are alive. The president of the Belgian League of Remembrance pronounced this memorable phrase in 1919 at a cemetery in which were buried many of that country's heroes from what was then known as the Great War. Such carnage over the previous years defying the notion, now known not to be true, the second such conflict could ever occur again. There are graves that are alive. I have often thought of those words and what they mean since I first encountered them some years ago in reading a history of World War I. And now, today, on this stage, recognize the valor of Sergeant Shemin and Private Johnson, I think I know. They mean that there are some men, some women, whose legacies live on long after their deaths, who we continue to admire, who we remain in thrall to, even as they live only in our memories. The ineffable essence of their personality, the remembrance of their acts, the inspiration of their examples, all of these transcend the individual's all too mortal presence. Private Henry Johnson, a member of the Army's all black Harlem Hellfighters. Sergeant William Shemin, the Jewish son of Russian immigrants. These men have graves 
that are alive. Army Private Henry Johnson stood, as Secretary of Work mentioned, a mere five feet four inches tall, but don't let that fool you. He was nicknamed Black Death and was heralded by no less an authority than Teddy Roosevelt as one of the five bravest men in World War I, and quite justifiably so. These words have already been spoken and will be again. But on an occasion like today, repetition is no vice, indeed a necessary virtue. Private Johnson and his fellow soldiers were serving as sentries in that dark night in France's Argonne Forest in 1918. When, as Secretary of Work outlined, they realized they were surrounded by more than a dozen Germans and in danger of being killed or taken captive. The German raiders opened fire on the two men, wounding Private Johnson three times and his colleague twice. Despite his injuries, Private Johnson fought on with an aggression that, by all accounts, shocked even the battle-hardened Germans. And he fought on even after his weapon couldn't fire. As Secretary of Work mentioned, he had one German with the butt stock of his rifle and then sunk a Bowie knife into another. He stabbed to death at least one more attacker, allowing the weary Americans to toss hand grenades that finally prompted the rest of the Germans to flee. This brief, brutal encounter has been known in history and in legend simply as the battle of Private Henry Johnson. William Shemin has been described by his oldest grandson, Eddie Roth, as a broad-chested, broken-nosed, thick-armed man. I love that description, for it shows, and his photo from the time reveals, that he was a soldier almost from central casting. His commanding officer in the 47th Infantry Regiment, 4th Infantry Division, described him as cool, calm, intelligent, and utterly fearless. He was a boxer, a football player, skilled at baseball and lacrosse. He lied about his age, of course he did, and got into the army when he shouldn't have, and we promptly sent him off to the killing fields of France. There on that scorching afternoon, his platoon was involved in a bloody firefight in that very bloody war. From his trench, it is recounted that he could see the Americans injured, dying, littering the battlefield. He climbed the escarpment of his safety, and what happened next is best recounted by the contemporaneous words of Shemin's superior officer that day, Captain Rupert Purden, who wrote that with utter disregard of his own safety, Shemin sprang from the position in his platoon trench, dashed out across the open in full sight of the Germans who opened and maintained a furious burst of machine gun and rifle fire. Sergeant Shemin was wounded himself by shrapnel, but he would lead the platoon out of harm's way for the next three days until a German bullet pierced his helmet and lodged behind his left ear, an injury which hospitalized him for three months. As this recounting tells, Sergeant Shemin and Private Johnson, very different men, shared something precious, as the chaplain so beautifully rendered outwardly different but inwardly devoted to something we celebrate today, something we label heroism, although such a single word, noble as it is, seems inadequate to capture the rare qualities of such remarkable men. And their bravery, bravery prompts the mind to ask, what does lead men to risk their lives as these two did? Is it love of country? Is it love of their fellow soldiers? Is it something as simple as training? Yes, yes, and yes. But there is, it seems to me, so much more. So much more that can be recognized as necessary, although it is impossible to describe it in full. It is perhaps best to say that it is part of the beautiful mystery of human life that men and women act at great risk to themselves in pursuit of something beyond themselves. Maybe we can, in the end, be satisfied only with knowing that there exists in some people something so inviolable, something so important, that they would sacrifice their own lives to protect it, to ensure its continued vitality. Let us call it duty, honor, patriotism, love. Whatever we call it, let us be grateful that our country seems to be so blessed with an abundance of this scarce breed of person, Sergeant Shemin and Private Johnson being two of which we honor today. 
Since the six survivors of the Mitchell Raid were awarded the first medals of honor in 1863, citizens from presidents to privates have received the medal. The stories of the medal's recipients, their names inscribed, each and every one in the Hall of Heroes come from every imaginable background and from every station in life that this great land maintains. Like Private Johnson and Sergeant Shimon, they represent the diversity of America that is the source of our great unity as a people. And each, on that, each name on that wall has a story to tell. Stories like that of Vernon Baker, an African-American who trained in army camps during World War II in the stifling racism of the South, rose above that to earn the nation's highest honor, leading his men outnumbered and outgunned on the rugged hills of Italy. Or the story of Sadao Munamori, a Japanese-American awarded the medal posthumously after diving onto a grenade to save the lives of his fellow soldiers in the same series of actions as Vernon Baker. Sadao's parents received notice of his death while they were living in the same internment camp from which he had volunteered for duty in the United States Army. Or that of Lieutenant Commander Ernest Evans, a Cherokee Indian who commanded the USS Johnston at Leyte Gulf. In the furious battle, the Johnston stayed behind to guard the fleet's retreat but was soon left dead in the water. Evans refused to abandon his post, however, until every round on the ship had been fired, even the starbursts and the sandbag rounds. It is said that when the Japanese passed the American survivors floating in the water after the Johnston had sunk, they threw them food and water and saluted them, shouting, Samurai, Samurai. As for Evans himself, he was last seen astride the deck of the doomed boat, two fingers ripped off by the Japanese blast, shirtless, his own uniform burned off his body, but very much alive. His body would never be found. Some of the men and the women, too, in the Hall of Heroes hail from the smallest of towns, others from the largest of cities. Some had families who had recently arrived to this great land, others had families here since the Plymouth Rock. But all of these people, all of them, like those we honor today, had to use the immortal words of Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., hearts that were touched by fire. The fates of Private Johnston and Sergeant Shemin after the war would not be the same. Sergeant Shemin would go to college at Syracuse. He would play football, study forestry, start a business, live a long life until the 1970s, filled with hard work to be sure, but one anchored by the eternal verities of faith and family, a family of which more than 60 join us today, led by Sergeant Shimon's indomitable daughters, Elsie and Ina. Thank you for being here today, as you and your family inspire us too. Your steadfastness over the years, your love that transcends place and time, are examples to us all. Private Johnson was honored with a parade when he returned to New York, and the French among whom he fought was styled upon him the Croix de Guerre with Palm de Vice. But the injuries, nearly two dozen, as Secretary Work mentioned, that he had sustained were never properly documented, so he did not receive so much as a Purple Heart or the medical benefits that he had earned. He would die penniless in 1929, a very young man still, his war only a decade behind him. While the lives of these men took different paths, well, why they did that, there is no way to know, only to say that this too is one of the mysteries of human life. But one thing is certain, to say the least, the graves of Private Johnson and Sergeant Shimon are still alive, still vibrant in teaching us through their heroic deeds what soldiers mean when they recite their creed. For much of what soldiers profess, selfless service, honor, loyalty, duty, Sergeant Shimon and Private Johnson made manifest and enduring some of the most trying circumstances that fate could see fit to contrive. Fighting for a country that they loved. Love time, loved sometimes more than, sadly, it loved them back. The work of the Army continues to power our soldiers abroad, to care for with dignity those soldiers who are wounded, to honor our obligation to soldiers whose service is now honorably completed, to remember those soldiers who paid the ultimate sacrifice. May God bless those we recognize today and their families. And may God bless all of those who choose a life of service to this country and who left 
in the poet's words, the vivid air signed with their honor. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army. Well, good morning and thank you all for joining us as we honor two American heroes. From this old soldier's perspective, honoring these great Americans, despite the long passage of time, strengthens our Army and reflects the enduring commitment of our nation to those who serve her. Honoring gallantry in combat is essential to the foundational values upon which our Army and our Republic stand. By reflecting on the great valor of Private Henry Johnson and Sergeant William Shemin, our soldiers today garner strength to boldly fulfill our duty in today's challenging global environment. In the words of Winston Churchill, courage is rightly esteemed the first of human qualities because it is the quality that guarantees all others. And this is as vital today as it has been throughout human history. In addition to the inspiration drawn from honoring their gallantry, we celebrate today the diversity of our profession, an attribute attribute woven into the very fiber of our nation and a guiding light for all to aspire toward. Often on our nation's historic journey, we've fallen short of the lofty ideals of our Constitution. Booker T. Washington, the great civil rights leader, reminded us that there are two ways of exerting one's strength. One is pushing down, the other is pulling up. The men we honor today loved their country and did their duty in an inspiring example of pulling up all those around them. And their stories exemplify how diversity strengthens our profession. Private Henry Johnson was a member of the 369th Infantry Regiment, reverently known particularly to our veterans here today as the Harlem Hellfighters. During World War I, President Woodrow Wilson mandated that the American Expeditionary Force would fight as a national force, separate from the European armies, but made an exception for the colored regiments, and several, including the 369th, were attached to the depleted French Army. And so it was that Private Johnson was the first to be recognized by our French allies with the Croix de Guerre, their highest military award for valor. His valor went unrecognized by our own country until 2003, 74 years after his death, when he was awarded this Distinguished Service Cross. And now, finally, we award the Medal of Honor, as his actions so valiantly earned on that day. William Shemin experienced anti-Semitism throughout his life. Yet, when his platoon found itself in a desperate situation and in need of a leader, all looked to him because of his proven competence and courage to lead. He so loved his country. In fact, his entire life, he forbade all those living under his roof from criticizing the United States of America. Ever the committed patriot, he continued to serve his nation for the rest of his life, building a family of great Americans committed to selfless service, so many of whom are here with us today. While we are not perfect, the United States is a beacon of freedom and equality for the rest of the world. And today, by reaching back and honoring these great soldiers with their rightful recognition, we recommit ourselves as a profession exemplifying dignity and respect for all who serve. The ability to leverage the diverse gifts of all great patriots bestowed and endowed with the courage to serve remains 
our decisive advantage. Finally, we gain inspiration from these two gallant soldiers to reinforce our commitment to build leaders of character for the nation. Competence, commitment, and character are core attributes exemplified by Private Henry Johnson and Sergeant William Shemin in their inspiring acts of gallantry and in the way they serve their community after military service. Henry Johnson, despite his crippling combat injuries, served as an inspiration to the civil rights community during his life and for the decades to follow. And as it has been highlighted, President Teddy Roosevelt, as we all know, one of the toughest fighters ever to become the leader of our country, called Henry Johnson one of the five bravest men of World War I. That's pretty high praise. Yet when Henry was asked about the event, he downplayed his contribution. And in fact, he simply stated that he had just fought for his life, like anyone would do. Sounds like the humility of most heroes I've been blessed to meet throughout my Army service. William Sherman displayed the 4th Infantry Division Ivy Leaf insignia at his greenhouse and landscape company for over 40 years and proudly discussed the values the Army instilled in him with any customer who inquired. He lived those Army values, he managed his business, and he raised his family consistent with how he led in the Army in combat. He instilled, instilled his love of country and passion for service in his children. The Shemin family has honorably served their nation in the military during the Korean War and in our wars of the past 13 years. Miss Elsie Shemin Roth served in medical missions worldwide as a nurse, and for her service, she's been recognized multiple times, including receiving an honorary doctorate from Syracuse University. William Shemin's legacy truly lives on in the values and actions of his family. So today we honor the legacy of these great soldiers by dedicating ourselves to building soldiers in their likeness, professionals and leaders of character, protecting our great nation and all that it stands for, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you, God bless you, and Army Strong. Mr. Work, Mr. Carson, Sergeant Major of the Army Daily, and Command Sergeant Major Wilson will now join General Allen on stage for the induction ceremony. Receiving on behalf of Private Johnson is Command Sergeant Major Lewis Wilson of the New York National Guard. The President of the United States of America, authorized by Act of Congress, has awarded in the name of Congress the Medal of Honor to Private Henry Johnson. Private Henry Johnson distinguished himself by extraordinary acts of heroism at the risk of his life, above and beyond the call of duty, while serving as a member of Company C, 369th Infantry Regiment, 93rd Infantry Division, American Expeditionary Forces, on May 15, 1918, during combat operations against the enemy on the front lines of the Western Front in France. In the early morning hours, Private Johnson and another soldier were on sentry duty at a forward outpost when they received a surprise attack from a German raiding party consisting of at least 12 soldiers. While under intense enemy fire and despite receiving significant wounds, Private Johnson mounted a brave retaliation, resulting in several enemy casualties. When his fellow soldier was badly wounded and being carried away by the enemy, Private Johnson exposed himself to grave danger by advancing from his position to engage the two enemy captors in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Wielding only a knife and gravely wounded himself, Private Johnson continued fighting, defeating the two captors and rescuing the wounded soldier. Displaying great courage, he continued to hold back the larger enemy force until the defeated enemy returned, leaving behind a large cache of weapons and equipment and providing valuable intelligence. Without Private Johnson's quick actions and continued fighting, even in the face of almost certain death, the enemy might have succeeded in capturing prisoners and the outpost without abandoning valuable intelligence. Private Johnson's extraordinary heroism and selflessness 
above and beyond the call of duty, are in keeping with the highest traditions of the military service, and reflect great credit upon himself, Company C, 369th Infantry Regiment, 93rd Infantry Division, and the United States Army. At this time, Deputy Secretary Work will present the Medal of Honor flag. On October 23, 2002, Public Law 107-248, Section 8143, established the Medal of Honor flag to recognize service members who have distinguished themselves by gallantry and action above and beyond the call of duty. The Medal of Honor flag commemorates the sacrifice and bloodshed for our freedom and gives emphasis to the Medal of Honor being the highest award for valor by an individual serving in the armed forces of the United States. The light blue color with gold fringe bearing 13 white stars are adapted from the Medal of Honor ribbon. Receiving on, on behalf of Sergeant Shemin are his daughters, Miss Elise Shemin Roth and Miss Ina Shemin Bass. The President of the United States of America, authorized by Act of Congress, has awarded in the name of Congress the Medal of Honor to Sergeant William Shemin. Sergeant William Shemin distinguished himself by extraordinary acts of heroism at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty while serving as a rifleman with G Company, 2nd Battalion, 47th Infantry Regiment, 4th Division, American Expeditionary Forces, in connection with combat operations against an armed enemy on the Vail River near Bescoche, France, from August 7th to August 9th, 1918. Sergeant Shemin, upon three different occasions, left cover and crossed an open space of 150 yards, repeatedly exposing himself to heavy machine gun and rifle fire to rescue wounded. After officers and senior non-commissioned officers had become casualties, Sergeant Shemin took command of the platoon and displayed great initiative under fire while until wounded on August 9th. Sergeant Shemin's extraordinary heroism and selflessness above and beyond the call of duty are in keeping with the highest traditions of the military service and reflect great credit upon himself with Company G, 2nd Battalion, 47th Infantry Regiment, 4th Division, American Expeditionary Forces, and the United States Army. At this time, Deputy Secretary Work will present the Medal of Honor flag. The plaque will now be unveiled, inducting Sergeant Shemin and Private Johnson into the Hall of Heroes.
Thank you, Deputy Secretary Work, Under Secretary Carson, General Allen, Sergeant Major of the Army Daily, and Command Sergeant Major Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Shemin Roth. Good morning. Secretary Work, Secretary Carson, General Allen, Sergeant Major Daly, and other senior leaders of our armed forces, members of Congress, and distinguished guests. What a privilege it is to stand with you today. How deeply honored my family and I are, and my father would have been, to share this happy day with so courageous a figure as United States Army Private Henry Jack Johnson. How wonderful that these two brave men are being honored together. I grew up knowing that my father was a hero in the Great War. He never talked about it. But at family gatherings, his sister, my grandparents, and all the Shemin cousins shared stories of my father's bravery in battle. When I was a young girl, my Aunt Mildred, who was my father's sister, showed me a meticulously kept scrapbook that she had compiled. It included photographs, newspaper accounts, and documents from the United States Army outlining his selfless deeds performed while serving this country. This was the first time I had a sense of what my father, at 19 years old, had to endure in order to save the lives of his fellow soldiers and his own. One day, when I was about 12, I was sitting on our porch, chatting with Jim Pritchard, a big, smiling Irish policeman. He was a dear family friend and one of the three men that my father rescued from the battlefield. Jim told me he believed that my father deserved, but had been denied, a higher military honor. I asked him why he felt that way, Jim looked at me and said, you're now old enough to understand this. Your father never got the medal that he deserved because he was a Jew. Indeed, I did understand. I immediately went to my father and said, Daddy, is this true? How could this be? Why didn't you say or do something? My father was silent for what felt like a long time. When he finally did speak, he very quietly told me that what Jim said was true. Anti-Semitism was a fact of life. He also said his war experience was never about medals. He said he was fully satisfied with having received our nation's second highest military award, the Distinguished Service Cross. He was just honored to have been able to serve his country. He did speak about name-calling by anti-Semites and about fistfights that sometimes followed. However, anyone who physically engaged with my father probably did not know he was a boxer, a wrestler, or that he excelled in long-distance swimming, semi-pro baseball, and later played varsity football and lacrosse at Syracuse University. By the way, he was 5'10 and a half, weighing 190 pounds of solid muscle, one could almost feel sorry for the other guy. <laughs> we never discussed it again, because the bottom line was this. He was proud to have been a soldier in the United States Army's 4th Division and to fight for this great country. I left it alone because it pained him to dwell on a negative aspect of a time that he, in his life that he felt so proud of but it never really sat well with me. 
and I would think about it from time to time and wish that there was a way that I could help to make it right. In 2002, there was an opportunity for congressional review of the service records of Jewish members of the armed forces who may have suffered anti-Semitism. I jumped at the chance to engage with the Leonard Kravitz Jewish War Veterans Act, which included a complete review of all Distinguished Service Cross awards, but beginning at World War II. For eight years, I spoke to a multitude of people supporting this effort. I wanted to understand why they drew the line at World War II. Anti-Semitism, wherever, whenever it occurs, is disgusting. I needed to know why we weren't including soldiers of the First World War or any other war for that matter. No one could give me a logical answer. So I kept looking for a way to encourage reviews of allegations of anti-Semitism prior to World War II. That's when I received a call from Colonel Erwin Burtnick, retired, of the Jewish War Veterans. Colonel Burtnick is an expert in awards and decorations. He reviewed my father's citation and said that he felt that it did deserve an upgrade. He encouraged me to speak to my local congressman and start the process of requesting a review. At the time, I was living in the small town of Labadee, Missouri in Franklin County. My congressman, Blaine Luke Meyer, immediately said he would help me. Congressman Luke Meyer, his wonderful staff, and Colonel Burton, I took this on full force. It has taken us together, the three of us, 13 years to get here today. This would not have happened without them. Thank you, both of you. Irwin, wherever you are, thank you from the bottom of my heart. William Shemin's experience in the military has been the cornerstone of our family's legacy of military service. My brother, Emmanuel Shemin, now deceased, joined the National Guard at, when he was 16 years old. After college, he was commissioned, serving in the United States Air Force during the Korean War, attaining the rank of major. My son, William Roth, served four years in the United States Marine Corps. My son, Joseph Roth, a commander in the United States Navy, recently retired after 20 years, including service in Afghanistan. The love of service to our country spoke to my father. He remained a proud soldier his entire life, despite a head wound that never quite healed and resulted in deafness and shrapnel in his back, embedded so close to his spinal column that surgery was far too dangerous to undergo. He sought help at the VA hospital. They diagnosed him with what was then called a nervous condition, now called post-traumatic stress disorder. He was designated 100% disabled. He never complained, never, and never once spoke about the action that got him the Distinguished Service Cross and now the Medal of Honor. I can only imagine it was all too much for a then 19-year-old to truly come to terms with. My father, on occasions, was quick to anger, but he had a hearty sense of humor. He mellowed later in life. Throughout his life, he sought out and made himself available to veterans in need. He would bring them personally to appropriate agencies and find them jobs and refer them for medical help. He understood the very, very hard transitions. The lighter side of my father was the man who would refer to me and my sister as his right-hand man. After breakfast, he would say to us, all right, men, let's go to work. <laughs> he would also, we also had to police the grounds every day. <laughs> and everything had to be done in a military manner. And I mean everything. There were 14 grandchildren, 10 girls and four boys. They all know how to salute 
as well as raise, lower, and properly fold the flag, and they all completed Sergeant Chemin's rigorous basic training. <laughs> I would now like for you to meet the other right-hand man, my wonderful sister, Ina Shemin Bass. There she is. <laughs> Maybe the room isn't big enough, but they're only the grandchildren, not the grandchildren, because then everyone would stand up. Stand up the grandchildren, all of you, and boy, do they have stories. They have big stories. <laughs> During the Depression, my father and dear mother Bertha raised three children. They sent us all to college. Together, they also ran a greenhouse and nursery business that they were able to turn over to my brother. My brother built on this success. Shaman Nurseries is considered the gold standard in horticultural agribusiness and can be found in 12 locations in the United States, including one here in Washington in Israel, in Holland, and in Canada. My father often said it was pure luck that several people just happened to see his action. So many brave men and women performed heroic acts that were never witnessed or acknowledged. I wish to accept this medal on behalf of them too. This supreme honor is in the name of William Shemin but it would please him if it also were dedicated to the fallen, the survivors, and the families who did not have the proper paperwork or representation depicting their valor. I hope to share this story across our country and ultimately place the medal in an appropriate museum. Finally, I want to leave you with this very, very important message. Whenever the United States has been threatened, Jewish Americans have been willing to make the ultimate sacrifice and fight for all the great things our country represents. We volunteer in numbers greater than our small population would indicate. We serve with distinction in units and divisions that, are direct, that directly engage the enemy, such as the infantry, such as the 4th Division of the United States Army. On behalf of Sergeant William Shemin, our family and friends, we thank you for being here to honor him. This true story could happen only in America. Peace be with each and every one of you, and shalom. Thank you. Have a wonderful escort. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shemin Roth. Ladies and gentlemen, Command Sergeant Major Wilson. Secretary Work, Secretary Carson, Jonah Allen, Mrs. Allen, Sergeant Major Daly. Just like to add a couple more here. Congressman Gibson. Major General Murphy, Major General Retired James, uh, my wife Teresa, 
and a friend we made this week, Ms. Tara Johnson. And all other senior leaders of the of our armed forces, members of Congress, and distinguished guests, it is my honor to join you today during this historic occasion. I've, I've seen a lot wearing this uniform for, for the past 39 years. I ended the service during the Cold War when training focused on a single threat. I've seen our Army transform and shape itself for the threats of the new century. I've trained soldiers at every level, from uh, section to battery, battalion to brigade, and a general officer command. Now I serve as the senior enlisted advisor to the commander of the New York Army National Guard and his 10,000 soldiers. I've served my neighbors in countless disasters from blizzards, fires, floods, hurricanes, and to assist in putting boots on the ground for 9-11. Few achievements have ever come close to the pride I feel in accepting the Medal of Honor on behalf of Sergeant Henry Johnson. Henry Johnson displayed the highest ideals of our Army values long before they were taught to our soldiers. In a time when Henry Johnson knew that his actions, his conduct, and his Harlem Hellfighters Regiment, and even his race uh, were under scrutiny across the Army and our country. Will the Hellfighters perform to the same Army standards of all, of all the white units? Was Henry Johnson just as worthy as all the soldiers in the American Expeditionary Force. What we take for granted today was sadly in doubt a century ago. In a way, I appreciate that scrutiny. Just 10 years ago, I mobilized for war and served with, with a National Guard task force in Iraq. At this time, at that time, just over half of the American forces in Iraq were from the Army Reserve and the Army National Guard. Would citizen soldiers perform to the same Army standards as regulars? Was I just as relevant a member of our total army. We take for granted today the role of all our soldiers in the force, but believe me, in 2005, there were all still doubts about the relevance of the reserve component. Like Henry Johnson, I had something to prove and that the extra load in my ruck helped, me mo helped motivate me and my soldiers not just to succeed, but to excel. We are a professional, profession of arms that values our history, our traditions, and our heroes. We teach those values and that, history, and that history to each new generation of soldiers. Henry Johnson was always been that hero to the 369th Infantry, to the New York National Guard, and to now our Army and nation. Henry Johnson rushed from Albany, New York to the regiment's recruiting station in New York City in the spring of 1917, knowing full well that the National Guard's 15th New York Colored Infantry Regiment was going to war in Europe. With the weight on his shoulders, Johnson mobilized and joined the now famous Harlem Hellfighters, the 369 Infantry Regiment. Alongside his fellow soldiers, Johnson faced down adversity, first in deployment training here in the States where white regiments and many communities looked down on the regiment and even after arriving in France where the units served as manual labor before move, moving into combat and serving under French command, where combat readiness was more important than color. We recognized his loyalty, his duty, his respect, his selfless service, his honor, integrity, and personal courage for Johnson's actions in the spring of 1918. But in the end, Henry Johnson's bravery was really just inspired to protect his battle buddy, Private Needham Roberts. Attacked by a raiding party of more than a dozen enemy troops, Johnson fought off intense enemy fire and ignored his own wounds to save the life of his badly wounded comrade. He would become the very first American soldier to receive the French Corps de Guerre to recognize for his heroism. I am proud that our nation has now recognized him as the Medal of Honor for his actions. I am honored to stand here today on behalf of our men and women of the New York National Guard, today's citizen soldiers, to carry on Henry Johnson's legacy. And after 39 years, this is a moment that will carry forward beyond my career for future generations of citizen soldiers. Thank you for the opportunity and being here today, and God bless. Thank you, Command Sergeant Major Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand and join in the singing of the Army song. The words to the Army song can be found in your program.
March along, sing our song with the army of the free. Count the brave, count the true, who have fought to victory. We're the army and proud of our name. We're the army and proudly proclaim. First to fight for the right and to build the nation's might. And the army goes rolling along. Proud of all we have done fighting till the army. And the army goes rolling along. Then it's high, high, hey, the army's on its way. Count off the cadence loud and strong. For wherever we go, you will always know that the army goes rolling along. <laughs>